Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining back for another episode of The Theological Arsonist. Today, I am joined again, I think the third time now, by my dear brother, Joshua Janier. Um, for those of you who don't know him, Joshua, could you just give a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Yeah. Um, right now, I will be enrolled at Reformation Bible College in Sanford, Florida, um, to pursue the ministry of Word and Sacrament. Um, my interests are in systematic theology and modern philosophy just recently. Um, I also lecture at my church in dogmatics and philosophy, and I have a YouTube channel and an upcoming website. Um, my YouTube channel is Reform Dogmatics, and you can catch me on Instagram at Joshua Janier. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, brother. So today we're going to be getting into a topic that is much needed um, in, in today's climate and culture and has been needed throughout the ages. And uh, Joshua is a systematician, and I am a simple man. And so um, I, I just always go back to John chapter 17, where Jesus is praying, and he prays that his people would be one as he and the Father are one. And he declares that it is through this oneness that people will know that he is the Messiah. And so I think that there is a great need for us as Christians to unify, um, to come together, um, especially uh, against the, the common enemies that we, we face. And I think that we are uh, very willing to um, divide from one another over secondary things and over issues that can be set aside to fight for the common good. Now, I know both me and Joshua believe that unity cannot come at the expense of the truth, of course. And so we must stand firm in our convictions and our confessions um, where the truth lies. But at the same time, there is a deep need for unity. And I think a lot of Christians are running from this reality um, to, to trade it for um, argumentation. And so Joshua is going to kind of open us up and bring, bring this uh, conversation into a more directed way. And I'm going to just kind of join with my, my comments here and there. And so, uh, brother, if you would just start wherever you want, we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you. So specifically, uh, when we talk about ecumenical unity, you mentioned John 17, and, and that's, that's a great passage. And, and that's, a, that's a passage that has been on my heart uh, for a while. Um, because it's it's one of it's I believe it's it's one of the most comforting prayers that we we hear um, that we that we see recorded for the eye of faith in Scripture by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed for me and for every Christian two years ago, and and then that prayer is that of ecumenical unity. And uh, and to talk about ecumenical unity, I, I think I think it's important that we turn our eyes to a figure in whom uh, I believe that, you know, Catholicity is really embodied. And that is the, um, the 19th and 20th century theologian, Herman Bobink. Um, to, to those who do not know Bobink, his dates are December 13th, 1854, to July 29th, um, to July 29th, 1921. Um, Herman Bobink was born in the Netherlands um, to, uh, to a reformed pastor who was well known in the old, you know, the old reformed church. And Herman Bobink, Later in his yeah, Her Herman Bob, his dad, in, in earlier years, he broke away from the German liberal church and would germ join the the Aufsteiging church. Aufsteiging is a Dutch word for separation, which was known as the Christian Reformed Church. So Bobbing he he grew up in, in in the Dutch context, Dutch conservative Calvinist context where Christianity was accepted. Um, Bobbing went to um, um, Zwolle Gymnasium, um, and that's that's the the, the high school in Zwolle. And then from there, he, he would enroll at the Theological School of Compton, um, which was the, the off skiding theological school. So it was like, you know, it's, you know of course, Bobbing is going to go there. Um, but Bobbing believed that he was not challenged at, at this school. Um, there sometimes Bobbing would even, wouldn't even show up to class because he believed that, uh, that he wasn't being challenged. Um, then he would transfer to the University of Leiden. And, and this, is, this is an important I believe an important, really an important and kind of, it didn't change Herman Bobbing's theology, but it definitely not influenced, but really just changed the way he saw things. He went to the, he enrolled at the University of Leiden and uh, many great figures taught and even studied at the University of Leiden, 
such as um, the French philosopher René Descartes, um, Jacobus Arminius, um, all these guys taught at the University of Leiden, and it was known as a conservative Calvinist institution for, for a while. But after the influence of German, German liberalism, everything changed. So a lot of, a lot of the people at, at, the, at the Theological School of Compton was kind of concerned that Bobbink would want to go to Leiden. Bobbink is in the Ofsguiding tradition. Um, Bobbink's church has parted ways from German liberalism. So it makes no sense for the son of John Bobbink to go to this institution. Um, but what really draw, drew Bobbing to that institution was the scientific method of an interpretation of his professors that he believed was needed. Um, and Bobbing would make great friends, um, great friends such as Christian Stein Kogranje. Christian Stein Kogranje is, uh, was a leading Muslim scholar um, of his day. Um, but mo but it, was, it was also a time of, of deep isolation for Bobbing as well. Um, a lot of they were there, you know, a lot of the men who went to that institution were not pious, they weren't godly men, um, they were liberals, and there was Bobbing, the conservative Calvinist. Um, so that, and, and of course, Bobbing, Bobbing remains, you know, a conservative Calvinist, um, really convictional. After that, his first tenure as, the, as a professor would be at the Theological School of Compton. Um, he taught there for a long while. Um, his praised work, Reform Dogmatics, was written at the Theological School of Compton. Um, but then from Compton, um, he would, because, and, and when you can't really mention Herman Bobbing if you don't mention Abraham Kuyper. Hmm. Um, you know, Abraham Kuyper um, he doesn't really deserve an introduction because he's, he's very well known. Um, Abraham Kuyper was the prime minister of the Netherlands and uh, the founder of the Free University of Amsterdam. And Kuyper would reach out to Bobbink multiple times to come teach at the Free University. Um, Bobbink would decline many times. And uh, after the year 1900, from yeah, 19, 1902 to 1909, um, Bobbink finally accepted that offer to teach dogmatics since um, Abraham Kuyper was no longer really closely related to the school. But something, as I said, Bobbink grew up in the offsguiding denomination, a conservative Dutch Calvinist, but something would happen in the year 1900 that would really influence Bobbing's theological development. Bobbing was known in the 1890s as an apologist for Calvinism um, since he grew up in the Offsguiding Church and his father was a reformed pastor. It makes sense that he was an apologist for Calvinism. But once the year 1900 hit, something radically changed. And for, for those who do not know, it was in the year 1900 when the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche died. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Nietzschean, you know, Nietzsche's philosophy didn't really have much influence in the Netherlands in, in the in the 1900. But once he died, it was just like this Nietzschean cult just came from nowhere. And this is important in regards to ecumenical unity, because Bobbing believed that it was soon where Dutch Calvinism would give way in in uh, in the in the Dutch society like like no like no other time. Um, but Bobbing soon realized after reflection and I believe wisdom that that was not the case. And then Bobbing would come out with a, with a lot of great works for that day, um, such as Christian worldview and, and the philosophy of revelation. And when we, when we notice, notice, just notice the use of and, and the title, the, the use of terms in the title Christian worldview, right? We know that Bobbing remained reformed all of his life, a conservative Dutch Calvinist, but he uses the word Christian worldview. He doesn't use the term reformed worldview or Calvinistic worldview. He uses the term Christian worldview. He even says in page 71 of that book, Christian worldview, that there's only two worldviews to you know, view the world as in a theist way or a non-theist way. And this is, this is, this is very, very important because this, this is theological development that happened in Bobbing because of this Nietzschean Ubermensch springing out of nowhere in, in, Dutch, in, in Dutch society. And I believe the reason why Bobbing, you know, chose the word Christian is because when he looked at the atheism of his day, you know, they weren't concerned with particulars. They weren't concerned with the offsguiding church, the Christian Reformed Church, the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church. They were concerned as for for Christianity as a whole, and because they were concerned, um, because they were concerned for Christianity as a whole. The best, the best bet that Christians face, right? Because Bobbing believed that Christianity as a whole, just not the Reformed tradition, but Christianity as a whole faced an existential threat. The best bet we got is to unite 
and attack our enemy, right? And that was, you know, 100 years ago, right? That was 100 years ago, 120 years ago, right? Just imagine where we are right now. I, I believe I believe that the conditions of today do not deserve, I mean, yeah, they, they, they're prominent for every Christian, right? Whether it's abortion, whether it's Marxism, socialism, we can get into all the isms of today, but we cannot deny that where Christianity was in the 1900s is far worse than, you know, is where we are right now is far worse than what it was. Um, and, and, <clears throat> And, you know, what, what, what as Christians can we do, right? What as Christians that, you know, in, in scripture, we're commanded to give an apologia for the faith, for the hope that lies in us. What can we do as Christians to battle against this common enemy that, that we face? And, and, and this is something that James Anglinton points out in the biography is that all Christians are in the Valley of Elah and we face one Goliath, right? We are the covenant people of Israel and we face one Goliath. Right? right? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Christianity right now faces an existential threat. It's not necessarily Nietzsche and Ubermensch, it's Nietzsche and Superman, right? But, but God is still dead in our 21st century context. Right. Yeah. People are not looking to Christ for, 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 for morality, for the law. People are not looking to, to revelation to guide them in, in, in faith and in, in life. But people are looking to themselves, right? We, we, we face this, this same issue that we face in the Garden of Eden, and that's autonomy. Um, and just, just, just all the things that I said of a Christian worldview, we can see where the, the apologetic method of Cornelius Van Til, then expounded by Greg Bonson, you know, people familiar to a lot of people here, um, that we, we understand where this, where Van Til gets his influence from, you know, this, this, you know, these antithetical worldviews, the Christian worldview and the non-Christian worldview, right? There's, you know, what, what are we going to do as Christians to battle our common enemy. Um, I, I believe that it takes, and, and what I'm not proposing is that we drop all our theological convictions. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I believe right now we have to turn our eye to our enemy. Um, right. And it's not, it's not, it, our enemy does not reside in, in people, right? Our, you know, cause you know, we're, we, you know, the all Christians are evangelists. Right. All Christians are, are evangelists and, and our enemy are not, is not people. But our enemies are ideologies. This is what Paul says, right? Um, and and we we face and we face an existential threat um, because of these ideologies, all the isms. I you know I, I guess a question that I would I would I would pose to every Christian, right? Who's who believes that they're a soldier of the cross for just you know just I, I and I think I think it's uh, well it's commendable that you want to hold to your theological convictions, but you know just you know casting down a brother. Right? And, and you believing, okay, I did that. Now I'm a soldier of the cross. Um, I'm going to receive my crown in heaven because I, I stood up for a certain theological doctrine, right? And I'm, which I'm not undermining by no means. Right. Um, now, now I believe that I'm a soldier of the cross. Um, you know, you know what? What the question that I would pose is: What? How are you going to fight your common enemy? Um, mm. What do you have to say <laughs> when when an atheist approaches you and they don't have in mind? specifically reformed epistemology right so you can't really talk to them like they you know, like the, and like the conversations assuming a reformed worldview but they just have a christian worldview they they, they have they they're they're attacking the christian tree they're not yeah. coming for the for the branch of reformed theology they're coming for the whole tree of christianity and I, I, th I think i think that's that's really important to emphasize because i think that is where the problem is the secularists don't see denominations but Christians do. And that, yeah. that's exactly what the problem is, is you have this, this ideology, this group of ideologies <clears throat> that's coming in with the aim of obliterating and demolishing Christianity. And then you have Christians that see their one denomination as being the Christian church. And, and how, how are we going to fight these ideologies that are trying to eradicate all denominations when we are focused on our denomination as being the Christian denomination? And again, like you said, this is not to say that, because uh, I, I think when people hear the word unity, they, they also think very much in the way that you were just saying how words are redefined. The word yeah. unity has been redefined, and so many Christians fall for the trap of of that redefinition of unity to think unity just means 
regardless of beliefs, regardless of anything, we just, yeah, you're, you're perfectly fine. And there's nothing, there's no gripe here at all. And that's not at all what we're saying. What we are saying is that anybody who holds to a Trinitarian Christian faith, so our Catholic, our Orthodox, our Anglicans, Dutch, Reformed, whatever, we can unify with these communions in joining against this common threat to Christianity. Again, Christianity, not, not any one denomination. We can join together without conceding, say, to Rome that justification is not by faith alone right? Mm -hmm. We can, we can unify with Rome in fighting the common enemy without unifying doctrinally on all points. So I think people need to recognize that there is a distinction between unity as Christians and doctrinal unity, which is a completely different kind of unity and a completely separate issue at this, in this particular context. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, And a lot of times it can be mistaken that that's what I'm asking for. No, I mean, I believe that, you know, certain theological doctrines that are that are defined and really, you know, emphasized by the Reformed tradition are, are comforting for the conscience, um, such as the doctrine of election, right? You know, that, that I've been chosen in Jesus Christ. Um, you know, just the, these these are these are important theological doctrines that are necessary for, for Christian piety. I understand that. And, and our Christian piety is not going to cease because we 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 call for ecumenical unity. But because, and I think it has to do with wisdom. I, I think it has to do just as Bavink reflected on his Dutch context and the Tunisian Ubermensch just sprout out of nowhere. And he realized that I was wrong. Bavink for a long time believed that Dutch Calvinism would give way to in, 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 in a way that it's never had in his Dutch context. Um, but Bavink, after reflection of, of where the state of theology is, because because Bavink realized that if God is dead, right, you know, now Christianity, you have to answer a whole set of questions, right? You know, there's there's different needs now that you have to address, just not in the, you know, in the in the public context, but also in the pew, um, because these this literature is being exposed to everybody, right? You, you go to work and then you, you, you're facing this, this, you know, the guy who holds Nietzsche's philosophy. What am I going to do? What, what is the person in the pew going to do? And there, there's, and I, I can't, I, I, because I think the ideologies of today are just so complex. I can't, I can't necessarily pin one down, but, uh, and that's not the only one that was present in the 20th century, but what are we going to do? Be all these ideologies right now, especially, and, and this has to do with the way that we write theology, that what are, what, what issues are we addressing, right? Is most of our publications being aimed towards 17th century to, to debates that were going, you know, on in, in 17th century scholasticism, or should our writings be aimed towards 21st century atheism, right? You know, I, I think of, you know, I, I think of just there's so many works, you know, authors like Nancy Piercy, um, uh, I, I think Francis Beckwith, he has he has a lot of stuff on, on abortion, right? These these are issues reoccurring. I, I I mean, you know, the slaughtering of innocent children. I mean, if Christians don't see an issue in this, I would I would check their heart that that what it means to be a person is being redefined right what it means to be human is being redefined by our secular context right right with with the abortion activists somebody you know i don't know if i don't know if they have this infusion theory that a substance is infused to the fetus and then it magically becomes a person or in order to be a person you need to you know you need independence or cognitive faculties that's that's not how the Bible defines a person. That's not right. how Christians two millennia have defined a person. And, and not just that. If I if I could jump in, that's not traditionally right. even how pagan nations defined being a human for so long. Exactly. We we forget that even a great empire like Rome, like all of these Greece, Rome, Persia, all of them believed in a higher power. All of them. Mm-hmm. And so we're really for the first time in history facing a worldview that is coming to basically say there is nothing, no heaven above us, no hell below us, right? There, there it's, it's the John Lennon theology, if you yeah, will, that's yeah. coming in. And basically, I mean, people really, I don't think, think deeply enough about how novel, what a novelty this worldview actually is. 
the greatest pagan nations of all time still believe that there was a higher power above them, all of them. Yeah. And so yeah. this is the first time we're seeing a worldview that's basically saying there is nothing else besides what we can see materially with our eyes. And, 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 and this just, just relates with what I said. This comes from, you know, German philosophy, Nietzsche, God is dead. Right. Um, that, that is that is the confession of every unbelieving person right now. You know, God right. is dead. And, 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 and as you said, I mean, I just think about what Bobbink wrote, you know, until the 17th century, revelation was not questioned by anybody. You know, revelation was assumed. Um, teleology right. was assumed. Um, it, it wasn't until the Enlightenment and modern philosophers such as John, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, you know, Anthony Collins, that just redefined, re, you know, just, I mean, when reason is seen as, as God and what stipulates and what, you know, sanctions everything, um, that, you know, revelation must be brought down to the level of reason and any, any conflict that we see between revelation and reason, reason triumphs. If that you just just go go down the rabbit trail, just just right. you know where where does Immanuel Kant's philosophy lead us? You know if epistemology if epistemology is developed, you know if, let's let's just say um, this this is something we're Kant's known for: three transcendentals, God, the soul, and the world. And these three three transcendentals cannot be known. If God cannot be known, what does that lead to? Just leads it, it leads to redefining of how we know God. Right. Frederick Schleiermacher, right? God can no longer be known, but God must be felt by feeling, right? And that just continues. Right. It just continues. It continues. God okay, cannot I, be known. I was, I was just going to yeah. go ahead and finish. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just, just, follow, just follow the rabbit trail to where these philosophies lead. I mean, you know, it's, it's argued that Immanuel Kant had good intention, but if God can no longer be known, where does that lead? If God right. is not known, if God cannot be the object of knowledge, I, I just see it naturally leading to Frederick Nietzsche and God is dead. Right. Know, there is no God. If God cannot be known, there is no God. If theology doesn't provide knowledge, theology shouldn't be taught in the university. That's, right. look, at the, look at the universities today. And it all stems from this one period in history, the Enlightenment. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, too, I, I just find, I find it so strange that the pursuit of knowledge through human reason is the outpouring of a denial of deity. Yeah. Like it's yeah. just, it's such a strange, strange. Um, and it really, it really is. I mean, on a, on a deeper, more spiritual level, it's mm -hmm. that whole idea of crowning oneself as God. Of right. Of um, course. But getting back to what you were saying about how, you know, this elevation of human reason and how it all stemmed from this this German philosophy that came and kind of just took over everywhere now. Um, re recently, I wrote an article in response to a theater organization that I was part of that um, came forward and basically expressed the, the affirmation that they would stand by biblical Christian uh, understanding of marriage and gender and sexuality over against some people that I used to be in this organization with um, who are demanding that they now conform to the LGBTQ plus agenda. Well, anyways, wow. I've been in this back and forth conversation with uh, pretty much the guy who's been heading up this whole pro LGBTQ thing. And I pretty much asked him like, how do you ground the idea that Christianity as a whole needs to be redefined to accommodate these different sexualities and stuff. How do you do that? Because you, you can't appeal to scripture because scripture is against you here. You can't appeal to the church or tradition or history because it's against you as well. And he explicitly stated, I'm appealing to reason. In my reason, I can look at scripture and see that it is not objective in these areas due to mistranslations, all that kind of stuff. And the church being made up of fallible men, I can't trust that as being objective either. Therefore, I can only rely on my reason to help guide me in terms of Christian principles and stuff. And right there, you see how even the secularist attitude is even slipping into the, the realm of the Christian label as well, you know, which is a really scary thing where reason is now being elevated as the standard of truth rather than the, the Holy Scriptures.
Yeah. And I mean, I, I just think of publications written by John Locke and Anthony Collins because these were quote unquote theists, you right. know, they're deists. Um, but, you know, John Locke wrote, 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 a, wrote, wrote a work where he said that reason stipulates and sanctions the scriptures. Yes. You know, I, I have a lecture on this that, that unless, you know, revelation reason, they're, they're just, unless they're unanimous, unless they, there's no conflict there. Right. But if there is conflict, reason triumphs that we, we, we throw out. But what 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 you know, what aligns itself with reason we keep um, right. this, this it, it all it all stems from enlightenment thought. Yeah. And exactly. I mean, and, and, it, and it goes and I just think about Van Til's apologetic and just uh, I, Van Til's. I truly believe that Van Til's apologetic is rooted in scripture in scripture. Right. You know, there's an antithesis that 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 runs throughout the whole corpus of scripture. Yes. It begins with the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Yep. Right. And then it be, then it continues with Cain and Abel yep. and then Moses and Pharaoh. And then, it, you know, climactically to the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus, you know, Jesus and uh, Jesus and uh, uh, what was uh, the, the emperor at the, uh, at the time of Jesus uh, at, t- at the time of his uh, birth? I think it was it wasn't Claudius, was it? No. <laughs> yeah here i am a history nerd not remembering yeah yeah um yeah i mean you know just that that antithesis you know jesus was you know as i said moses and pharaoh i just think of when jesus was who, who was the guy that tried to that killed all the babies in bethlehem um, herod right yes herod jesus and herod yeah. um yeah herod what which herod it was we don't know but it was Herod. <laughs> it was herod <laughs> um so there, there. That's and, and this is a, this is an, this is a spiritual antithesis, of course, and the spiritual, right? This, you know, because as, and this is something that that you and I both agree on, right? You know, coming from you know an Augustinian definition of what sin is, sin just doesn't confuse the will, you know. Sin corrupts the whole person, right? Adam in the Garden of Eden is corrupted in his will his affections for God and the way that he thinks, right? There's no etic effects to sin. Sin infects the intellect. And that's, that's where we need God's grace after the fall. Yeah. Um, and really quick so, on that, I, I yeah, just, this is kind of a side note, but something I was thinking about in terms of the Augustinian understanding of sin and stuff is like prior to sin entering the world, there was this probation period, right, for Adam, where he's given, you know, o- obedience or death. Um, mm-hmm. And what's amazing is we sometimes forget that he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, and we think, okay, well, what does that mean? And this is where people I think totally mess up total depravity, because they 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 forget that good part in the tree. Adam is capable of understanding good. But he's now trying to do it apart from faith, apart mm-hmm. from trust in, in, in God and in Yahweh. Yeah. And so ultimately, I, I, just, I just think it's interesting because when I think about sin, a lot of times people just think just total moral corruption, people just yeah. running around doing all this stuff. And I'm like, no, it's, it, what it is, is it's faithless living. That's, that's, yeah. that's all it is. Total depravity is faithless living in all areas. So it yeah. doesn't matter how morally upright someone is. It's faithless living. And Paul confirms this in Romans 14 when he says, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Well, there you go. That's, that's all we mean by total depravity. So yeah. a little bit of a and, side note, but I, I think it's important to recognize that it wasn't the tree of evil. <laughs> it was the tree of good yeah. and evil. And that led Adam to basically, quote unquote, as we hear so often promoted today, to think for himself, you know. I mean, and I just, I turn to Van Til's corpus in the defense of the faith where he talks about this because the defense of the faith is not a systematic book. It's the defense of the faith. He says that this, you know, and this is what he, he's, you know, he, he makes this, this connection with the temptation of the, of, of the, of the serpent in Genesis chapter three, relating to all false forms of religion. And, and, and what he has in mind is Roman Catholicism, but since, since, since uh, not just not only Roman Catholicism, but also Islam, this false ideal of comprehensive knowledge, right? Or this false ideal of outgrowing our finitude, 
that that because what like what what we say is the the problem that we face today the problem we face throughout history is autonomy right the you know all you know all sin and this is something that's really important in the reformed tradition you know especially considering considering the westminster standards all sin is a conflation of the creator creature distinction right and that's ultimately what we see in genesis chapter three yes. where as you said adam is no longer trusting in the revelation given to, given from on high that you are not to eat of that tree but he's trusting in his own self he's no longer trusting in the god that he's supposed to you know find his his whole trust in but he's trusting in himself and he's and, and satan lays out this false ideal of comprehensive knowledge right and, and this is and, and this has to do with with epistemology that because i don't i nobody has comprehensive knowledge nobody Right. Just because we don't have comprehensive knowledge specifically of God doesn't mean that that knowledge is not true because right. the knowledge that we have is rooted in scripture and in natural theology defined by what well, 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 that that's for another video. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there we have, you know, there's, you know, a Adam is truly offered freedom in the garden. Right. And I saw I saw your video on Thomas Aquinas and, and, and the human will yep. that. You know, freedom is is the freedom to to do good. You know, Adam, at, you know, the classically defined by the Reformed tradition is that Adam is created in true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. You know, your heart is well says in the doctrine of the covenant that Adam is free to do good out of right. the goodness of his nature, but he would receive the highest freedom to only do good by way of covenant. And that's, we believe, the covenant of works, right. where Adam is able to pass that sanction or that or that that probation period and and just find his life in god right you know that's that sabbath rest you know we're getting into biblical theology but that sabbath rest yep. that was offered to adam in genesis 1 through 3 would would be consummated in, in a communion bond between the creator and the creature face-to-face -to -face communion bond you and know really, the high the highest good for man to be with right, god right and that that sabbath rest is the pinnacle of freedom yeah. What people don't recognize, like most people do, I think, if they give it a lot of thought. But what Adam did by sinning was he traded freedom for bondage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people yeah. don't recognize that God basically, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a picture of do this and live merely. It wasn't do this and live, do this and die. It was do this to be free, <laughs> do this yeah. to be a slave, right? And so Adam chose slavery for in the, instead of freedom. And that is why we need Christ. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to regenerate our hearts because we are in bondage. We are not yeah. free. And so the, the Spirit's work in us enables that freedom to then increase in our freedom as we sanctificate. What is sanctification if not a growing freedom, right? A growing freedom to the the ultimate pinnacle and i really i mean i love thomas aquinas see he's like i just love love thomas aquinas but one of the things that he basically said is when we're when we're in paradise when we're in the new heavens new earth eternity whatever you want to call it our wills are not taken away yeah. it's, it's not as though we don't have will anymore and and it's like we're just totally restricted. You're made perfect now. You can't do anything else. It's that our wills are so liberated into freedom yeah. that we will every waking second never choose anything other than God because God yeah. is the ultimate freedom. And so it's not that our wills have now been squashed. It's that our wills have been liberated to the point where they have no need of anything else. And that ultimately is, you know, the beatific vision. So, yeah. And yeah, that's that's as we said, you know, you know, be free or or be a slave, and and to sin, as Jesus said, you know, he that commits sin is a slave to sin. This is, a, sin this is a great talk on ecumenical unity. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're going um, like, yeah, I know. But just just to get back to that antithesis, um, to get back into the apologetic method, and 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 you know, what's common with unbelief, and as you were saying, you know, the guy that you were talking to, reason, you know, that's that's what we're facing. You know, because I mean, you know, in Van Til, he has, you know, something called common notions and how there's even, co you know, there's common notions between believers and unbelievers, right? We're both creating the image of God, right? We both have wills. Um, um, you know, one will is liberated, one will is, is not. But there's also common notions amongst unbelievers in the way that they think. All unbelief 
you know, you know, you know, as, as Paul said, right, you know, what, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So therefore, you know, every believer, not necessarily think they don't think the same way, but ultimately they are the standard. They, I mean, I, and I can just, so many, I, when I watch atheist debate, it doesn't matter who it is, even unbelievers as well, when I watch them debate, I mean, it's, I'm the standard of reason. What I say is, right. it's, it's, I want to write something on this, right? Because, and, and this has to do with transgender ontology that, you know, I'm a woman. Just as God spoke the world ex nihilo, you believe that you can create, you can just transform your ontology ex nihilo. That's idolatry. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> right? So there's, you know, it's just the use of speech, the way that they talk, it's like, they're creating something by the word of their power. And then we'll, we'll, we'll save that for later. But um, I, everything's rooted in idolatry. It's, it's a conflation of the creator creature distinction that you believe that you are the creator. Vanto writes in, in his great essay, um, I forgot the name of it. Uh, I, I, yes, I remember it's evil and theodicy. That it's either, it's, there's only two options. There's only two options that human beings are laid out with. It's either you, 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 you see your need, you posit the need for objective revelation and subjective illumination by the spirit, or you believe that your, your intellect has not been wounded by the fall, right? Those are the two options laid out for us, right? It's either we see our need for God's word and the subjective illumination of the spirit, or we believe that our intellects have not been touched by the fall. We don't even acknowledge a fall. Of course, nobody's going to acknowledge a fall because there's no heavens above. There's no hell below. God is dead. And, and it's, it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. But because we see that antithesis, right, we shouldn't be arguing against the people that are on our side, right? Right. If, if, we're, if we're, and this is something that Doug Wilson debated James White on, yes. to truly affirm justification by faith and to be consistent is to affirm that Catholics can be saved. Right to affirm regeneration preceding faith, right, or effectual calling, to use the words of the Westminster Confession of Faith, to affirm that, right, is to affirm that and to be consistent is to say that Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, um, et cetera, you know, you know uh, just, just different forms of Christianity, Pentecostals, all right. of them can be saved because the spirit blows where it wills, right? Right, right? it is, it is, you know, because otherwise, the, otherwise you're left with the the idea that a doctrinal confession saves. plays a role in our justification, and right? that's and that's a denial of the Protestant <laughs> doctrine of justification by faith yeah. alone, right? And and that's that's so so true, and and like and and but but we we need to understand who is it that saves? Right. It is the triune God who saves right? God saves whom he wills, right? It's really sad that I see my Calvinist brothers following, falling into the errors of the army. How can you say that, that you've been chosen in Christ? To really say that Catholics can't be saved is to say that God, you know, and this is something that the, the delegates of the Senate of Dort were really against the Arminians saying that God looks into the future to see who believes, right? What, what the Calvinist is saying when, when he says that his Roman Catholic brother cannot be saved, is saying that God looked into the future. He saw that I affirmed Reformed theology and he saved me because, you know, and, and something, my pastor preached a sermon this Sunday. Um, he said that, you know, a proud Calvinist is an oxymoron. Truly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can even say a proud Augustinian is an, an oxymoron, you know, to, to believe that, that the grace of Christ has been shown to me dis, in spite of anything that I've done. It's just, it's just God's free grace to me. You know, you know, it is God who saves father, son, and Holy spirit. All things are wrought from that one Trinity. You know, everything, everything of our salvation is from the Trinity. Um, God, you know, if we, if we can, if we confess classical Trinitarian theology, you know, inseparable or, or inseparable, um, uh, inseparable operations, right? That you know, you cannot separate one work of the Trinity. The Father can't do something without the Son, right? It is God who saves. And to be a proud Calvinist is, is to be an oxymoron. And I believe that every Calvinist, if you're consistent with your confession, you know, you should have the heart of your Savior. If we're if we're just consistent Christians, we should have the heart of our Savior in John seventeen three, um, mm -hmm. that he he wants his church to be one. 
Um, and, and, and I believe that, that as Calvinists, as Reformed, and the reason why I brought up Herman Bobbink, although we had a lot of discursus, Herman Bobbink, in the year 1900, he realized that Frederick Nietzsche's philosophy was permeating everywhere. Therefore, everything that he wrote in the past, like, for example, his dogmatics, he would come out with his reformed ethics a little bit later because he's been working, he's worked on that for a while. But Bobbing didn't, didn't have a lot of publications on worldview, on epistemology, on revelation, because it wasn't being questioned. Mm. Bobbing completely directed all of his attention to the one common enemy that he was facing, and that was Nietzsche. Um, and that was, you know, the modern philosophy of his day. I believe as Christians, if we're going to, if we want, if, you know, if, if we believe, you know, I believe that the organic nature of reality is Christianity permeating society. Um, Christ should not be separated from culture. Um, revelation should not be separated from pedagogy, et cetera, politics. It's, you know, it should not. That's just the organic reality of, that's just organic reality. Um, and if we, how is that going to happen? You know, and, and the, the reason why the LGBTQ community is so strong is because they're united. The reason why the abortion activists are so strong is because they're united. The reason why, the reason why they have a voice in society is because they're united. And we wonder why Christianity doesn't have a voice. Yeah. We're not united. We're, we we're have a bunch united. of secularists yeah. that are going after the Catholic Church going, we're going to rid the world of these Christians. And then you have some Christians standing on the sidelines going, those aren't, those, that one point something billion people, those aren't even Christians. <laughs> well, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, yeah. it just, it, it, again, I, I think what you just said is so poignant, right? The, the unity that is seen within these secularist ideologies and movements is something that we as Christians should be striving for. And that's, that's sad to have to say, Yeah, <laughs> but, it, but it's yeah. true. Yeah, it's really, and, and that we just, we, we, when we look, when we look at, and I believe that, the, of course, the Christian church grows when it faces persecution. Yes. And, and also the Christian church unites when it faces persecution, um, you know, throughout the ages. So I believe as, you know, if, if we, I believe that every Christian, you know, all Christians believe in the Trinity, and that's, you know, you know, to, to, you know, b belief in God, belief in, you know, one God, the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, you know, um, that when the Nicene Creed, if, if you hold to, the, you know, the, the, the Apostles' Creed is the summary of the gospel, mm -hmm. right? And I think, I think, I think a lot of times, and this isn't, this isn't really common with people who are, who are mature in the Reformed faith, because they understand that, that the subjective benefits of the gospel that are conferred by the spirit are not the gospel. Justification, the order salutis is not the gospel, right? Um, right? The, go the gospel is God saves. You know, the benefits that are conferred to us, justification, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, all of these are subject to the benefits of the spirit. But the gospel is just once that God saves. The saying is trustworthy and true. Christ Jesus came into the world to die for sinners. That is the gospel. When, when Paul lays out the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, everything is the objective acts of redemptive history that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. The gospel, according to the Bible, is the objective benefits that Christ attains for us. And of course, those are conferred subjectively by the spirit, right. but the gospel is God saves. And right. any, any, any person who holds the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, Chalcedonian definition, they confess that one gospel. They, may, they might err, well, well, uh, they might err in some areas, and, and I, I completely, I will, com I will acknowledge that. I would, I, there might be err in Trinitarian theology in the sense that what is the role of the spirit in salvation? Um, they might err um, in, 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 in the, I guess, in the order salutis and in the, in the subjective order of application. They might err in those things, right? But those things are not the gospel. Those are just praise really God bad. that when we arrive at the judgment seat of Christ, there's not going to be a test on doctrinal purity, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Because I, I think oh, th this is this is something, Joshua, that's been heavy on my heart. Because um, I mean. Over the past couple months, I've I've undergone a number of theological changes, 
And the one thing that, that just goes through my head regularly is how arrogant do I have to be to believe that my theology is perfect comparatively to the rest? You know, I mean, if, if, I, if, if God put me under a microscope, I would be a heretic, I'm sure. You know, I, all of us would be in some way. I, I know that as humans, our nature is fallible. Even the great St. Augustine, <laughs> you know, or people that we look up to in church history, Calvin, Luther, all of these people, they had theological issues. Some, some like in Luther's case, very apparent at times, right? The reality is, if I'm putting the emphasis on what is the gospel in that in any way, then the question that I should be asking is, do I actually believe the gospel? Do I actually believe the gospel? Because like you said, right, um, the, the, it's kind of an oxymoron to say that there's a you know, proud Calvinist, right? If we truly understand the gospel, then we should just be oozing humility at every step that we take, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not about what I believe in terms of my doctrinal purity. It's about what Christ accomplished. That's the gospel. And ultimately, I would even say the gospel is the Trinity, right? The gospel is not just an objective reality, but it, or of, of like a set of words or things written down. The gospel is a person, and it's the person of Jesus Christ sent by the Father and applied by the Spirit to humanity. And that is, and faith is the means by which we apprehend that gospel, but faith is not the gospel, right? And so that's the beauty of it is faith is assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. And so if we talk about faith as though it's the conviction of things that we see and know and study and systematically put together, then we don't have faith anymore. You know, yeah. there's a there's an element of mystery to faith that must be respected right. and a reality that I don't have all the answers. I will not have the answers. And that's why I need faith. Right. So sure. and yeah, I mean, that's a totally yeah, I mean, different bunny trail. But I think one of the big things that we can do as Christians to strive for ecumenical unity is coming around the gospel together, because I yeah. can look at a Catholic and go. I may think you have some serious flaws in a lot of different areas, but you believe the gospel. Same with the Orthodox, same with the Pentecostal. And so the reality is, you know, if we, if we truly, and I think, I think it was a mistake to allow Rome to usurp the word Catholic as, as their, as, cause I'll, I'll give them the Roman Catholic church, but we are Catholic. You and me are Catholic, right? And I think that so many Christians are, unaware of this reality, but I'm a part of the Catholic church just as much as you're part of the Catholic church and the Catholicity of the church is what we need to come and unify around, um, which is yeah. shared by many different communions. Yeah, that is, that is true on, on Rome erring on, on, I, I'm the Nicene Creed when it says, I believe in one Holy Catholic church. It's yes. not talking about the Roman Catholic church. That's right. That's right. In the Athanasian Creed that in order to be saved, you must hold to the Catholic faith it does not have in mind the Roman Catholic Church. Right. Because the, the nature of the church is not, not, not expressed in the Athanasian Creed. That's right. right. What's given is the content of the Catholic faith, Jesus Christ and the Trinity. And Amen. the Trinity coming, the Trin God, Jesus Christ coming to save us, the Spirit, God sending, the, God sending his Son to save us, and God, sent, God the Father and God the Son sending the Spirit to apply that work. Yes. And, and that's, I, I, that, that's my call. I mean, if Herman Bavink and and this this is this is something that I don't want to do, um, Bavink did not drop his theological convictions um, for a long time. There was this like two Bavink theses that uh, that Bavink was facing an internal crisis that of, of orthodoxy and modernity, but but he wasn't. Bavink's theology is organic; it develops over time. Um, Bavink, Bavink understood mystery. Um, there's, there's this uh, essay written in the Westminster um, Theological Journal by Bruce Pass, Dr. Bruce Pass. It's uh, Revelation and Reason and Herman Bavink. And he just quotes multiple times from Bavink's corpus where he says, 
Bob, he says, everything is mystery. Justification by faith is mystery. Regeneration is mystery. The incarnation is mystery. Psychology is mystery. All these things are mysteries, right? And, and, and I think to be a Christian, right? And, and, and this just goes back to Calvin's Institutes, right? To know, to know oneself is to know God, right? To know that, you know, to know that you are created. You are finite. You do not know everything. And you need God's word to guide you and you need his spirit to lead you right. um, to, to understand, you know, just Calvin, I just think of Calvin as a dude to know oneself, to know God, right. To understand that you're created, your theology is not perfect. Um, and I think, I mean, another, another thing, another thing that's important to me is worship and the way that we, we, we organize worship and the things that we sing in worship. Um, because I believe that our hymns and, and our, you know, just the, 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 the singing of, of hymns and psalms, those, the content of those hymns, and of course, the psalms, of course, there's going to be good content there because it comes from the corpus of scripture, but especially our songs that we sing, they should be theology rich because there's so many preconceived notions and, and heresies in our heart that needs to be rooted out by the singing of psalms and hymns um so it, just to understand that to know oneself to know oneself as created in the image of god as finite as creature and as a christian who belongs to jesus christ and who has been given special revelation right you know special revelation does not come in conflict with our reason but our reason can it doesn't come down to the level of reason right there's it's when we, when we talk about the incomprehensibility of God and how God is simultaneously incomprehensible and knowable because he reveals himself in his word. There's even there's parts in the, there's parts in the scriptures that we will never understand right. because and this is something that I write in my lecture that special revelation cannot be reduced to the bounds of human reason because its source is by nature incomprehensible. Right. The one whom revelation comes from is the ontological trinity to use the words of Ben Till. So therefore, even the, even the content of special revelation is, in, in, is cannot be reduced to our human reason. Um, and just, just yeah, if, if we understand that, if we understand, and, and another thing, if we understand where we are, you know, you as, we'll, we'll call ourselves, um, you know, uh, uh, what is it, optimists, yeah, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're you know, we, I would say that I'm an amillennial, um, but I'm optimistic. I'm an optimistic amillennial. Um, you and I, I guess you can say that about yourself too. Yeah. Optimistic um, amillennial. I go with that all the time. So that yeah. Works. Yeah. So, um, as, as optimistic amillennials, right. We believe that the church is in infancy. Uh, um, we don't believe we, we don't hold John Nelson Darby. You know, we don't believe that, that in 10 years, five years, two days, one day, one minute, we're going to be raptured out of here. We're still in infancy. Uh, we're still in infancy. Uh, the church is in infancy. If we if we recognize where we are um, as 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 Christians, as um, we're still in, we're the church is still in infancy, and we face an existential threat. Right. Um, we face an existential threat from you know a redefining of what it means to be human. And you know, I was months ago I was talking to my elder um, over coffee, and he said that. You know, in the early church, what was most controversial was Christology. Mm -hmm. um, at the time of the Reformation, it was soteriology. And in, in our modern times, it's anthropology. That's right. Um, what, it, what it means to be uh, a person, what it means to be human. Um, and who better to speak about it than Christians? That's who, right. By the grace of the Spirit, as Peter says, are, part are participants of the divine nature. We know right. what it's like to be human. To be, to follow God and to glorify God and enjoy him forever is to truly be human. Right. Who better to speak about what it means to be human than, than people who are, who, are, who are living and being conformed to the ultimate human, right. as Paul said, the image that, of Christ. And that is, a, that's, that's really like to, to take a very deep look at what's going on. Yeah. Right now, the war that's going on is a fight over what it means to be human, right? And ultimately, you have the Christians that are being conformed to the image of Christ, which is the image of God, where the, the image is being restored in Christ Jesus. And you have those outside that are dehumanizing themselves, 
their their you know nt Wright, his conception of hell is basically the idea that you're going to have beings there that were once human but are no longer because they cease to reflect the image of god in any any sense anymore you know they because of their they're on this path and in, in that way he basically says that eternity has already begun right you have christians that are already it's the already not yet kind of framework but we're already made partakers we're already seated in the heavenly places and so in that sense we are already bearing the image of god Again, it's restored in Christ Jesus with this sanctification leading to the final consummate glorification. In the same way, you have almost a desanctification that's happening to those yeah. who are secularists. They are walking further and further and further away from what it means to bear the image of God, ultimately to their deglorification, which is to be removed from any semblance of humanity. You know, and to me, like I, I think that that's pretty much my my definition too of of heaven and hell heaven is ultimately bearing the image of god as we were intended to and hell is ultimately ceasing to bear the image of god yeah. and so i think that's recognizing true. that that is the reality of what's going on can help us as christians to recognize that even though the secularists look like they're on the offensive these are people that are withering away that we should have the utmost compassion and mercy and re reflect the heart of Christ towards them and call them to repentance, call them to freedom, right? Call them yeah. to the freedom that's found in the restoration that Christ is, is doing in the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Christians should not forget their mission because, you know, what is, you know, the, the commands of God can be summarized into, you know, love, love for God and love for neighbor. That's who right. is my neighbor? Um, who is my neighbor? Um, you know, just, you know, just, I guess, I guess it's an understanding of common grace. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things. And, and, and in order to, in order for ecumenical unity, there's a lot of things that certain denominations, they have to redefine the way that they do things because a lot of times ecumenical unity is hindered because of practices that are, you know, unbiblical. Right. And this, this, even there's, of course, you know, there's different doctrines, but there's certain practices that, 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 that just for ecumenical unity, you can't, you can't have like, you know, you can't have like a broken arm. Right? You feel like if we're going to be the whole man, the whole Christ, we can't have a broken arm or a fidgeting arm. Uh, we need an arm that functions properly. And then in the way that certain um, denominations do apologetics, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, denominations that do apologetics with like no substance is just sub subjectivity. There's there's a lot of you know training that and in, 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 in order for to, to have like a medical unity, the whole Christian church must have the same mission. It is we face a common enemy. Um, it is not necessarily Nietzsche, Nietzsche Nietzschean philosophy. It's Nietzschean philosophy has well developed since the 1900s. We face a common enemy. And therefore, the role, and, and this has to do with the role of pastors, the role of elders, the role of, you know, people who teach in the church, like you and myself. Um, we have to train our people to fight this common enemy and to preach the gospel to all nations, right? Because mm -hmm. this is, this is, you know, when, when we look and I'm like, I, I, you know, when I, when I, you know, me being part of an evangelism committee at my church and, and just doing evangelism a lot because I enjoy it, just talking to people. And just to talk to people who, who are lost, it's really, really sad. It's, it's really, really sad. You know, it's like, this is, this is, this person is fashioned from the dust, from God's hand, created in God's image to glorify and enjoy God forever. But yet they don't, they serve Satan. They've made a covenant with Satan and they will die. They will die for an eternity. And the, and, the, and the treasures, as, as, as the psalmist says, in your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That will be kept away from them. And, the, and this is something that all Christians should say. You know, it was once said, if you don't want other people to be saved, you're not saved. And right. I, I think we, we should just, we should, we should understand that, hey, why, why, yeah, why am I, right now, why am I arguing against people who I will see in glory Yes. There's people out there dying, perishing. 
Right. Let's call mm-hmm. people to repentance and faith. And let's preach the good news. The gospel is good news. It's the greatest news to ever come across my ears. That Christ Jesus died for sinners. Right. That God saved me. That's that's good news. And, and that should be the heartbeat of everything that we do. It should be the primary intent to preach that good news and to defend that good news against um, uh, just not a nation, just not the American nation, but a world that hates that right. good news. That's right. Yeah. And I, I just, I was just thinking too, I, I think you start to, you start to have an understanding of the heart of God towards humanity when you recognize that humanity as a whole, Christian or non-Christian, is actually being given covenant blessing from God through the, the Noahic covenant, right? Because right there, God made a covenant with Noah that never again would he harm all flesh on earth, right? And so you, you see that, that God actually made a covenant that includes those who do not, that profane his name, ultimately. Yeah. And so people don't recognize that common grace, as we commonly call it, is actually a covenantal grace from God. Yeah. Um, and I, I just I just find that beautiful. And I think it should show us the patience, the mercy of God, and in doing so, compel us to unify with one another and show mercy and patience and compassion as we go and evangelize the world. I mean, Joshua, at the end of the day, I don't want to reach the end of my life and go, you know what? I did a really good job arguing justification with Catholics. <laughs> yeah. At the end of my life, I want to know that I lived a life of faith, unifying with those that I have disagreements with, preaching the gospel. Like, for example, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the work that Lila Rose does um, for, in, in live action with um, abortion. She's a Catholic and she's doing absolutely phenomenal work to end abortion. And I would, without even hesitating, partner in ministry with someone like her. Of course. And so the question that I have, and again, that's not to boost me up and go look at me, I would do it, would you? But a genuine question, would the people listening to this, would you do that? Would you partner in ministry with a Roman Catholic? Would you partner in ministry with an Eastern Orthodox? Would you partner in ministry with a Baptist, a Pentecostal, an Anglican, a Dutch Reformed, a Presbyterian? Would you do that? You know, And if you in your head have some hesitation, examine that. Why, why is that hesitation there? And it might come down to an issue of pride, right? It might come down to an issue of pride. Because... Yeah, I- because if we are unwilling to unify with brothers and sisters that are sharing the common fight against evil in this world, in the name of the triune God, then we are actually the schismatics, right? Yeah. We're, we're actually the ones who are being schismatic if we're not willing to do that. Mm. So. And I think we're, we're hindering, I think we're hindering what God is doing through those ministries. That's right. Because people, people, innocent babies being saved from being slaughtered that's a work of god's hand right and to to hinder that and to not unite with that because of some because of a different doctrinal formulation um i I think yeah it's rooted in pride i just want to i want to end with you know scripture by the apostle paul second corinthians chapter five Mm. and then we can we can end in prayer therefore we are ambassadors for christ making his appeal through us, um, um, for, forgive me. Therefore, we are amb- ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin um, to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, that's that's our goal. We're ambassadors of Christ. Amen. If I can end in prayer. Yeah, go for it, brother, please. Your gracious God and, and heavenly Father, um, I thank you for, for the beginning of, of history. You have called a people into your one holy and Catholic apostolic church from Adam and Eve being the first members of it um, to the nation of Israel, but they didn't have a Catholic nature then to the Gentiles brought in by Christ. Um, Father God, may we, not, may we, may we remember that, that it is one church that we, are defend, that we defend, 
um, uh, we defend the church of Jesus Christ and, and, the, and the one gospel of Jesus Christ. So therefore, um, I pray that this video will serve as a means to brothers who, who have strong theological convictions that are commendable um, to not necessarily drop them, Father, but to, to, to realize that that we face an existential threat. Christianity as a whole faces an existential threat. And uh, we are called to defend um, your church. We are called to defend the heresies brought up your, against your church um, and the, the, the ideologies that are brought up against it. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will uh, pour uh, your grace into our hearts in order to do that, in order that we may have the strength and, and the encouragement to do that. Um, and ultimately, Lord, may, may all of our hearts reflect the, the, hearts, uh, the heart of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in John 17. And uh, we ask all of this in his precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother.